Lord God, we praise you as God and we hail you as Redeemer. Lord God, we praise you for the great joy of uh, what Wayne shared with us in the congregational prayer time and that there are now uh, more members of your church, more who can hail you as Redeemer because they've come to a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We hail you as Redeemer and your goodness in reaching us and in reaching, uh, reaching new souls through us is a marvelous blessing for which we praise and thank you. And Lord, as we open your word now, Living God, we ask that the earth would hear your voice. Living God, would you silence every distraction? Would you send away every unclean spirit? Would you subdue our flesh? Would you banish our unbelief and our excuse making? Would you speak by your spirit that the earth may even now in this moment hear your voice? Amen. We want to open up together this morning to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. It's in the Old Testament. The big fat books are like the Psalms and then Isaiah and Jeremiah. And if you keep going a little bit past Jeremiah, you get to Ezekiel and then to Daniel. So if you can find Daniel chapter 6. Actually, so we're going to go back, Lord willing, we'll go back to James uh, next week. When I was deciding what to preach on in consultation with our elders, some of our spiritual leaders around here, uh, it was between James and Daniel. We ended up with James. Actually, my Amy was voting for Daniel, and she was not happy with me when I picked James. But we have since reconciled. Uh, I, um, I can't live long with her unhappy with me. Not, not long. But uh, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6. And actually, so I read the book of Daniel maybe five or six times at the very end of 2020. And I read it with I read it with three commentaries, which was an interesting experience. One commentary that I read while I was reading Daniel was a commentary published, I think, in, in 1919 or 1920. I think I ripped it off from Dorothy Brusco, if memory serves. And then the second one I read it with was published in 1950. And the third one was just published a year ago. And I, I tell you, I took that one from Darren Bauer's office. But anyway, I used those three. And it was, it was quaint to read this commentary that was written in 1920, putting the visions and the prophecies of Daniel with the League of Nations and the conclusion of World War I. And then to read this one that was written at the, at the very beginning of the 50s, to put these, the signs in Daniel with the end of the Third Reich, the, the end of the Second World War, and sort of what was happening ramping up toward 1960, and then the, the recent one. And on top of that, I'm reading Daniel, and then I'm checking the news every day. It was like uh, Trump-Pence, Biden-Harris, and then the election and all the aftermath. And I'm reading about Babylon persecuting Daniel. And then I'm looking at this kind of promise that the Biden-Harris administration make that in their first 100 days, they promise to pass the Equality Act, which is a, a very significant threat to Christian churches and religious freedom all over the place. And looking at Daniel, what it says, how he behaved himself, how he trusted God, the theme of the book of Daniel is Daniel 2, verses 20 and 21, which says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Daniel wrote in very tumultuous times. And Daniel says here, every king that gets into position, God brings them into position, and every king that is removed, God removes them. And in the book of Daniel, the kings did some very rank things to God's people. They persecuted God's people. They threw Daniel in the lion's den. They threw Daniel's three companions into the fire. And yet the book of Daniel insists, 
when those things happened, it was never the case for a second that God was like, oops, shouldn't have let them get into power. Look what they did to the church. Every single time, God is sovereign. And when God's people suffered that persecution, when they needed wisdom and endurance and strength and might, to God alone belongs wisdom and endurance and strength and might. And he gives wisdom and he gives understanding. It's my conviction in 2021, and honestly, I, I, I hope it was also my conviction in 2019, 2018, as far back as I can remember, to be more grounded in God and more steady in the Scripture, the crazier circumstances and events unfold. We've got to go deeper into God's Word and deeper into the character of God. Fear and sensationalism drives eyeballs to screens. And when eyeballs are on screens, clicks are made which generate revenue for advertisers. How's this for a conspiracy theory? Sensationalism and fear drives eyeballs to screens. And when your eyeballs are on the screens, those who have paid the, the advertising to get that revenue, the more your eyebrows, your, eye, your eyeballs are driven to that screen, the more revenue for the advertisers. Uh, events will unfold. Maybe they really are crazier than the events in 2020. And maybe those really were crazier than 2019. But I can guarantee you, whether they're crazier or not, there's a huge movement to drive eyeballs to screens to generate clicks, to generate revenue for advertisers. But even if things are going crazy, is it the case that God is less in control than he was? Even if God's people are thrown into the fire or into the lion's den, is it the case that God's promises are just a little less reliable? than they were before. You see, Daniel shows us what it's like to be grounded in the character of God and steady in the Scripture so that whatever happens and wherever most of the eyeballs and the hearts in the world are driven to, we are never driven away from the reliability of our God and the steadfast assurance we have in His promises. As we prepare to open Daniel, I want to give you a thing from, it's actually from President uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So it was spoken, actually, this was spoken many times in many of the speeches that he made, maybe 110, 108 years ago. And I don't give this as a, I don't give this as a political diagnosis of, of America. I give this because when I came across it, I said, that's exactly, exactly what we see in the book of Daniel. Theodore Roosevelt said in several of his speeches, he would have this line, there are three things that will destroy the United States of America. And again, I don't offer this to our country. I offer it as an understanding of what we're going to see in Daniel. Three things that would destroy. First, peace at any price. Second, prosperity at any price. And third, safety first before duty first. Three things that would destroy. First, peace at any price. What we see in the book of Daniel from the very first chapter is the authorities that be telling Daniel, all you have to do is drink the king's wine, eat the king's meat, bow a little bit to the king's statue and you'll be at peace in Babylon. But Daniel shows us that there's something far more important than peace at any price. Second, prosperity at any price. By the time we get to Daniel 6, by the time we get to Daniel 6, Daniel is basically the, the vice president and the speaker of the house, and he is in the, the top position in the government. And there's a little ask to him in Daniel 6. Just quit praying for 30 days. 
And the thing is, if he, re- if he gives in to this little ask, he can maintain his prosperity, he can maintain his power, he can maintain his position, and I'm sure the argument could be made, well, look at all the good Daniel could do for God's people if he maintained his prosperity and he maintained his power. But Daniel knew that it would be destruction to maintain prosperity at any price. And third, this one I think resounds the loudest of all in the middle of, or toward the end, hopefully, of COVID-19. Safety first before duty first. One of the things that concerns me as I talk to people about uh, COVID-19 is that it, it's almost become fairly common in our thinking that we have to stay safe. There has to be no disease, government, science, technology, vaccines. They have to get good enough to keep us safe. Beloved, from the word of God, there is no such thing as a safe life. Any government that promises, guarantees that it can keep you safe is lying to you. Any elder of the church who guarantees that if you follow his counsel, he will keep you safe, is lying to you. There is no safe life. There is only life. And life must be lived. Coram Deo and Soli Deo Gloria. Personal safety is something that we can consider and make reasonable concessions for. But staying safe is not essential. Honoring God and glorifying God is. The only life that we have is life on an unsafe planet in the middle of an unsafe administration. That's the only life God's people have ever had. But that's the life God gives them, and God says, follow me, honor me, pray to me, trust me, and whatever my word says, that's what you should do. This is the key, I think, that we see to Daniel. He doesn't put peace above all things. He doesn't put prosperity above all things. He doesn't put safety above all things. He doesn't put outcomes above all things. How often is it that I'm counseling a a church member, and they say, I need some advice, and they tell me the problem, and then I open up the Bible, and I say, this is what the Bible says you should do. And their response, it's not hostile. It's not that they don't like me or my counsel, but their response from the honesty of their heart is, well, if I do that, it might not work out. And my response is, I'm not talking to you so that we can work it out. I'm not talking to you to help you angle for an outcome. I'm talking to you because God has given us his word, and what he has said is what we must do. If we land in the lion's den, we land in the lion's den. If she leaves you, she le- if, it, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But working it out is not, it, is not the be-all and end-all. If God's word has spoken, then God's people receive it, believe it, and obey it. And this is what we see in Daniel. There is no safe and secure outcome. There is only the life that we've been given, and we have to live it for the glory of God. So let's look together at Daniel chapter 6. I've got a five-part outline, and it's actually in the uh, digital bulletin, which I have no idea how to access or even how it works, but Stephen and Bethany assure me that you all have access to it. So it, these five points are there if you want to get them. But I want to read through Daniel 6 and summarize the story in these five parts. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, first let's go through uh, verses 1 through 4. It says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom." 
Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. The first thing that we're going to see about Daniel is this. He was excellent in his work every day. That's verses 1 through 4. He was excellent in his work every day. Next, we'll look at verses 5 through 10. And here we're going to see the second point. Not only was he excellent in his work every day, he was faithful in his life through many years. Or actually many decades. He was faithful in his life through many years, many decades. Verse 5. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground or complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors, we're all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish this injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore... King Darius signed the document and the injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went up to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So what we see in verses 5 through 10 is he's faithful in his life through many years, and then we'll actually draw our third point out of 5 through 10 also, and that's this. Daniel talked with God by praying consistently. Daniel talked with God by praying consistently. Then we'll get points four and five out of 11 down through the end of the story. Look what happens next. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said to the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who's one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed, and he set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him, and then these men came by agreement to the king, and they said to the king, O king, that is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of the lions. And the king declared to Daniel, Oh, may your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought. Will we not encounter a large stone when one that's greater than Daniel is thrown into the pit of death? And what will happen then? And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and the signet of his lords, and nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. And at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And we're supposed to let our heart beat. Two or three times there at the end of verse 20, while those words hang in the air, and this king is, didn't want to see Daniel suffer. Then Daniel said to the king, Oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut those lions' mouths. And they haven't harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O oh, king, I have done you no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded those men who had been maliciously accusing Daniel, and they were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, their wives, and before they even hit the bottom of it, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones to pieces. 
Then King Darius wrote to all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever, and his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He it was who saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The fifth or the fourth and fifth points that we see out of, out of 11 to 26, the fourth is this proves that the worst times are the best times for growth. And the fifth is that Daniel trusted God and left the results to God. Daniel trusted God and left the results to God. So let's go through this story and see what we can understand about what should be our priority first of all in 2021. The first thing we see is that Daniel was excellent in all of his work every day. You see that in verse 3? Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And then the, the basically the officials said, what can we, in verse 4, what can we find against Daniel? And they say, we can find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. Right? These officials, these officials in verse 4, they're not Christian. They're not Baptist. They're not Catholic. They're not any of that. They, they, are, they are backstabbing Babylonian governmental bureaucrats. And, and yet they, they don't understand the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. But what they say is, the only thing that we know about this guy Daniel is whatever the Bible says, he's going to keep doing no matter what. What a testimony that Daniel had with the unbelievers in his life. And can I say this testimony was because of what verse 3 says, that he was excellent in his work every day. Meaning that he had a reputation of integrity, of kindness, of honesty in his work. All for church members who simply have that. As simple as that sounds, as basic as that is, the first point is, if you're going to stand the way you need to stand in life, you need to simply have an excellent track record in the basic things that you do. Meaning that if you have that that super important job of stay-at-home mom, you do that excellently with love, with consistency, with care. Meaning if you're retired but you, you know the neighbors on your street, they can always count on you to lend a hand, to be hospitable, to be honest, to forgive, to not, you know. Or if you're at work, just that your work is done excellently. How many of us, because we were allowed to work at home, we just got a little too used to wearing sweats and the quality of our work suffered? Beloved, it is as simple as this. The, the world is not going to become impressed because you say something spectacular about the Equality Act or the government or whatever. The world's watching to see how do you do your job every day? How do you treat people? How do you treat servers? How do you respond when someone mistreats you? When the, when the church is persecuted and mistreated, the society watching should expect us to respond to that persecution and mistreatment with forgiveness and kindness, which is the evidence of Jesus in us. Oh, for church members that this could be said of, Right? It's what we saw in 1 Timothy 2. He says, pray for kings and those in authority. He's like, what should you pray? That the world will change and this will happen. He says, pray that you can live a peaceful, 
dignified, godly life. That's verse 3, excellence in all that you do, so that you do a good job at work, and you're generous with your money. And when a, when a server messes things up at the restaurant, you tell them it's all right, and you tip them double, and you tell them that you're doing it for Jesus. Like, this is just the kind of person that you are. It's as simple as that. Lives of integrity and exemplary integrity. This is why in like in 1 Corinthians and in Titus and in some of the other epistles, he says in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, there's this guy in your church and, he li- and he's a member of your church and he lives so wickedly that I, I admonish you by the spirit of Jesus, you need to remove him from the membership of the church because if you don't, the testimony of everyone in your church is going to be dragged down by him. Do we have this living testimony of excellence and integrity? Well, second, not only was he excellent in his work every day, he was faithful in his life through many years, many years. So here's the deal with Daniel 6 and children's story Bibles. Here's how you test if your children's story Bible is accurate or if it's written by a conspiracy theory of liberal theology. Is the Daniel, is the picture of Daniel in Daniel 6 like a muscular guy in his 20s or 30s being thrown into the lion's den? Or is the picture of Daniel like arthritic knees and like basically he should be going to freighter to get his hips replaced like because he's 70 or 80? Because in Daniel 1, it says that it says in Daniel 1 4, the Babylonians uh, conquered Jerusalem and brought the youths into Babylon. Youth has to be 18 and below. So at the high end, Daniel was 18 in, in Daniel 1. Maybe he was 13 or 14, somewhere in there. This is 60 years later. 60 years later. Several uh, presidential or kingly administrations later. So here he's 74, 78, when these events happen. And yet if you remember from Daniel 1... Daniel 1, verse 8, when he is only 15 years old or only 18 years old, Daniel 1, verse 8, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Daniel set his heart and resolved that he would live with integrity then when he was 17 or 18. Here we are 60 years later. This edict about prayer comes down, and it's, it's as if we know what he's going to do before he even does it because this is the way the man lives year after year, decade after decade. Whatever all the eyeballs in the world are going to and whatever is generating the most clicks, the consistency of Daniel's grounding in the character of God and the, and, and the sufficiency of the promises of the word of God keep him as steady as can be. Faithful in his life through many, many years. I tell you, this is, what I, this is what is so precious to me about this church. I was talking to a friend of mine this week who lives in another part of the country, and I always, I always brag about you when I'm talking to my friend. I don't mean that in a, like a proud way. I just, I, when I see the, what the Lord is doing in your lives, and I'm talking to someone else I love who has never met you, I want them to get the glow of that as I describe what's happening here. And it just never, it is so you don't know what it means that Racine Bible has been in this city since 1927. And uh, we still give our money to go to proclaim Jesus around the world today the same way that we did back then. We haven't quit that. It's the same gospel, the same body and blood, the same baptism. The same way that people sat around tables and prayed for somebody who had cancer in 1929, that happened this morning in ABS. It's the same consistency year after year after year. You know, I mean, if you've, you, we've spent time together, you've, I hope I never strike you as like, uh, it's always been my dream that we would be the most trending church ever and get in the news. Like, the world has plenty of trending churches that are in the news and that are the latest thing. The world has plenty of fireworks and comets. I just want to be a fixed star. It doesn't have to be the brightest star. 
doesn't have to be the most impressive star, but I just want that star to shine that same light year after year after decade after decade so that when people know this thing isn't working and I need to find someone who will tell me the truth and love me while they tell me and, and help me, they, they know where they can come. They know where they can come. This is what we want. Consistency year after year after year. That's what we see in Daniel. It's a precious, precious goal to strive for. Well, number three, Daniel talked with God by praying consistently. Right? Verse 5. Then these men said, we're not going to find anything to complain about unless it's about something that he does regarding God. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in the upper chambers open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Do not miss the last clause in verse 10. As he had done previously. Daniel is not showboating here. Daniel is not hashtagging to become something that's trending and be spectacular. Daniel is doing here the same thing that he did when he was 17, 60 years ago. As was his custom for all these years, this is the way that he prayed. He was not trying to be a martyr nor a hero. He was just doing what he has always set out to do. Daniel prayed according to plan. Do you? We talked last week out of 1 Timothy 2 about how and when. How are you going to get into the Word of God in prayer? When are you going to get into the Word of God? This was his plan. It says there three times a day, verse 10. This is the, this is the phrase that comes up in the Hebrew, and it's interesting that it's Hebraic. In the West... This phrase shows up so many times in the Psalms. In the West, we would say at morning, at noon, and then in the evening. In the Psalms, it always comes up this way. In the evening, and in the evening, and in the morning, and at noon. O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the evening, and in the morning, and at noon. O Lord, I will lift up my prayer to you. And he has these three regular hours of prayer that he hits nonstop, no matter what. What is your how and when for how you're going to get into the word and get into prayer? For me, the best method for me is always reading scripture and then turning that scripture into prayer. I see that in Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. Ephesians 6, 17, taking the armor of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all perseverance, with all supplication for all things. See, praying in the spirit, verse 18, churches get, churches get so creepy about this. Praying in the spirit is not speaking in tongues, is not having dreams, is not doing weird things. Praying in the spirit, Ephesians 6, 18, is praying with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, open before you. That's what it means. One of my mentors in prayer taught me years ago, what is prayer? But inverting the promises of God back to him. The truest, best prayer takes the word of God and lifts it back up to him. So that's, all, that's basically all I do every morning. I just read the Bible, and there's something in there that I, I see that, and I know I am not yet that. God, would you change me? I repent. Or I see a sin in there, and it's something that I've fallen into, or I know somebody in this church, and I just know they're about to fall into that sin. And I say, God, would you help me to warn them? Would you reach them? See something to thank God for, something to trust God with? to read the word and lift it back up in prayer. We've got to do that consistently, day after, day after day, week after week, year after year. Do you pray consistently according to plan in the evening, in the morning, and at noon? What's your plan? Maybe you need to say, all right, uh, if I get in the car, if you drive, and I haven't prayed yet today, I am, I am never going to, turn on the music or the podcast or whatever in the car until I know that I've prayed for 20 minutes today. And so that, that drive becomes a drive of prayer. I would suggest with your eyes open rather than closed, but results may vary. How are you, you going to make sure that you get into the Word of God by plan? I know it's only January. We're already falling behind in our aggressive Bible reading programs. How are you going to be sure that you're going to, how and when? Uh, maybe simply make that, that sort of commitment. I'm not I am not going to eat anything until I eat a chapter of the Old Testament and a chapter from the New Testament. 
And if you're too busy and rushed in the morning, then you skip breakfast. Let's hope you have time for that chapter of each before lunch. If you're too busy and you skip lunch, then you just got yourself a 24-hour fast, but just do it but, but the next time that you can. We got we to gotta pray and be in the Word so consistently, and it's, um, it's because we think, that the, we think that the real world is what our eyeballs are driven to, but eyeballs are generated by sensational reporting, which generates revenue for the advertisers that back the reporting. It's just, it's just the way it is. This is, I didn't learn this from the Bible, but I just learned this from having my eyes open. I hope, I hope you don't take this as a conspiracy theory, but I just think this is reality. Beloved, there are many people, smart people, who are paid exorbitantly high salaries to write algorithmic code to determine where your attention will go moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. And you either live according to the plan of God on the principles that never change or you get tossed around by what, what everybody is clicking on. I heard somebody make this point last week, and as soon as he said this, like the penny dropped for me, he, his point was just a challenge. He said, I challenge you. I challenge you to remember the next to last thing that social media told you to be outraged about. Point made. I can only ever remember the last thing, but I can never remember the next to the next last thing because another one has to come because more clicks have to be generated, and the whole thing is just a huge hamster wheel. And so we think that that's reality. But hear, hear me say this in regard to the word and prayer. When you close your eyes to pray is when you are beginning to open your eyes to what really matters. And church, when you fold your hands to pray is when you are beginning to grasp with your hands the weapons of the only warfare whose results matter for eternity. To be consistent in the word and prayer, it changes the way we see things and the way we live. That's third. Fourth, isn't this interesting? Daniel's life proves that the worst of times are the best times for growth. Daniel's life proves that the worst of times are the best times for Christian growth. Not only does Daniel's life prove this, but you know, there are dozens, dozens of Bible narratives that prove this. The unfavorable soil is where the most godly character grows. The unfavorable circumstances are where the uncompromising Christian conviction is most readily formed. It's always in that crucible. Daniel wouldn't be Daniel if he didn't have a consistent prayer life. But there would be no book of Daniel unless Babylon prohibited prayer and Daniel had a consistent prayer life. You see, it's the unfavorable soil that's most favorable for the production of beautiful Christian character. Daniel is Daniel because of his courage and his consistency. But courage is only courage when it is tested by persecution or by danger. And consistency is only consistency when many others fall away because they say, well, we could make peace. Well, we could maintain our prosperity. Well, if we didn't do this, we could stay in a good position to influence events down the road. But the consistency stays consistent throughout. Daniel is only Daniel because he's living in Babylon with all of its harlotry, with all of its drunken revelry, with all of its barbarity and violence. It is Babylon that is the unfavorable soil that grows this most Christ-like, most consistent, most courageous character. It may sound like a paradox, but it is true that unfavorable circumstances are the most favorable circumstances for the development of Christian character. Only the pressure makes the diamond. Only the weight at the gym pushes the muscle development. You know that little poem, Good Timber? 
the tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light, but stood out in the open plain and always got its share of rain, never became a forest king, but lived and died a scrubby thing. Good timber does not grow with ease. The stronger the wind, the stronger the trees. The further the sky, the greater the length, the more the storm, the more the strength. It may be paradoxical, but it is a deep and abiding truth that unfavorable circumstances are the most favorable circumstances for the development of Christian courage, Christian character, Christian conviction. Prosperity and ease were not good for Israel. You guys are going through acts in ABFs right now. Prosperity and ease are not what is helping the church to grow. But it grows, but it grows. So whatever persecution comes, we're not afraid. We, 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 don't, we know I, I don't have to survive. I don't have to figure out the best move. I don't have to angle for an outcome. The only thing that I have to do is receive God's word and follow it. This gives us courage and confidence no matter what. Well, if that's the fourth about the worst of times and our best for growth, the fifth and final point is that Daniel trusted God and left the results to him. This is a happy story because Daniel survived. There are other biblical stories where the biblical hero does what's right and it costs him his life. I would say both stories, biblically defined, are happy. Wouldn't you? Daniel stood on principle and he refused to compromise. He trusted God and he didn't angle for an outcome. He left the results to God. Because after all, in, in, in a human way of seeing things, it was a small ask. Just refrain from prayer for 30 days. Don't you think somebody would have said to Daniel, well, they, they can't actually make you not pray in your mind. So just keep the curtains closed. Just do it in your mind. You don't have to do it the same way you've always done it. And then, and then you'll maintain your position. Then you'll maintain your power. Then you'll be able to do this and do that. And so many different outcomes that so many people argued for. But Daniel, Daniel's conviction was clear. He said, this is the way my God taught me to pray, evening and morning and at noon. And this is how I have served him for these 60 years, and this is how I will serve him. Because I don't have to survive, but I have to serve God. Daniel stood on that principle. He trusted God, and he stood alone. Church, if the outcome doesn't look favorable... That does nothing to change the godly principles under which we operate. Church, if other people fall away and make plausible, worldly, ear-tickling arguments that it would be okay for us to fall away a little bit too, that doesn't change reality. The only thing that matters is what has God said and what has God called us to. I don't have to create an outcome. I don't have to main, maintain my position as an influencer. I don't have to maintain the beating of my heart. But I have to trust God and do what he says. And Daniel left the results to God. I don't know if Daniel was, maybe he was happy that he survived, right? But I, I always go back to, um, remember Paul in Philippians 1? They're, like, the little debate club that's going to decide whether he's getting his head chopped off is literally, like, having their meeting. And Paul writes to Philippians, uh, I might be able to stay and be your pastor, or I might depart and be with Christ. Both are really good options. I don't really care which one. <laughs> because to die is gain. In another sense, I'm like, did Daniel really want to wake up in Babylon another year? I wouldn't. Like maybe, th maybe this was a disappointment. Who knows? Who knows? But I want to tell you, uh, our consistency in prayer, our consistency in the word, our courage in the middle of opposition, please hear this, church. This is gospel reality. Our, our time in prayer, our time in the word, our courage does nothing 
to save us or anyone else. We don't pray and spend time in the word because we need to do that to make God save us. The gospel is that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. And then Christ says, now that I've saved you, Paul, would you abide in me? Because if you abide in me, you'll have the joy and the fruitfulness that I've designed for you. So the gospel is, the root is that Christ has done it all. It's not Daniel's courage that saved him or anybody else. It is only the Lord Christ who saves. And maybe there's a hint of that here. I'm admitting I might be wrong. I probably am wrong. But I, I kind of see Jesus in uh, verse 22. Daniel says, my God sent his angel. There, there are Old Testament appearances where the Son of Man, in his, in, before he came as, uh, where the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, before he came as the Lord Jesus Christ, he shows up as, as the Son of Man or as some angelic appearance. It says here, Daniel says, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me. Remember earlier in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're walking in the furnace, and there's a fourth figure with them. Lions are mentioned not a lot in Scripture, but a little handful of times. And it's very interesting that the other places that they show up in the Old Testament, Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65. The one thing that is said about lions in Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65 is, when Jesus Christ returns to the earth, the mouths of the lions will be shut. For now... For now, nature is red in tooth and claw. But Jesus was born that as far as the curse is found, death would be no more. Would it not be like Jesus to be the one to close the mouth of the lion for Daniel? It is the reality that only Jesus saves us from sin and death. Our courage doesn't, our defiance doesn't, our quiet times don't. Only Jesus saves from sin and death. Jesus went into the tomb and came up, and all those who are in him rise with him. We see, first of all, for Daniel, that it was a flat, immediate no for peace at any price, prosperity at any price, or safety first before duty first. Because Daniel knew there's no such thing as a safe life. There's only life. And Daniel knew there's no such thing as controlling the outcome. There is only God and his word and what he's called me to do. Daniel trusted God, for God is the living God, enduring forever. Even in the words of Babylonian Darius, God's kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall never see an end for God delivers and rescues. Church, this is our God. We look to him every day in 2021. Let's pray. Lord God, hear your children as they pray. We are weak. We need your strength. We are not fixed. We are shifting around. And we need your stability. We need you to be our rock. Lord, strengthen our faith. Hold us close to yourself so that we might abide in you and we might have the, the conviction and the courage of those who are sure that you are God and your kingdom endures forever. Lord, hear your children as they pray and hearing answer for Jesus' sake. Amen.